All right, yeah. <laughs> Cozy. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for, for joining us here today. Authenticity. It, it sounds to me like an old thing. I think of old companies, I think of like mom and pop shops, the authentic stores not kind of the huge mega national corporations we all know and love these days that can advertise to us with massive data sets uh, around the world. It, the question being, I guess now, it's become again buzzy to be authentic, to have trust, yeah. but does it really matter? Well, like, why, why should we even care about these kinds of issues? Well, I, um, I'll start off, and okay. I, I think that this gets to the heart of a big challenge that exists in most businesses right now. It's that when we think about how we present ourselves, We've actually gotten really lazy over the course of the last 20 years. Like the promise in marketing in particular has been that we're going to go out and buy a bunch of technology. That technology is going to help us collect a bunch of customer data. We're going to take action on that customer data. And some point in that path of buying technology and collecting customer data, that system is going to help us find a magic growth equation. And that's actually what's most important. That's a farce. Like It's totally a farce. The hard work that you have to do as an organization is understand who you're doing what you're doing for. That's research. It's really hard, hard research. And then it's product positioning below that, how this product's actually going to solve the needs of that group of people that you're building for. That process doesn't exist consistently. It's been replaced by big data and the promise of a growth equation. And I think this gets at the heart of why we lack a lot of authenticity in organizations, because we just don't do the work that companies used to do. I think it's got to start with authenticity, right? If you're trying to factor that in, then there's something fundamentally wrong. If, if you're now having a discussion about how can we be authentic, I think you should have a real rethink about what's happened in the organization to get to that place in the first place. Not about our panel, though. We can talk about authenticity on the panel, <laughs> but if companies have to talk about authenticity, there's a problem. Well, I think people are really um, wary of big companies and brands in general. I mean, so to even get to that place of authenticity is pretty difficult because right now there's a heightened awareness of how their data is being used and how it's collected and it's not transparent or I guess a term that I prefer is legible where because transparent you can see it legible you can actually understand it and act upon it and companies have not done a good job of making that available well certainly companies seem to be like trying to be authentic we see plenty of advertising that uh, tries to speak to people about uh, their emotions or things they care about Perhaps the easiest one to bring up in front of a bunch of people right now is uh, Kendall Jenner hawking Pepsi ads in front of uh, a protest. I mean, talk to us about why, you know, if authenticity is so important, yeah. why is it also something you can so easily do wrong? Because I think it's, it's again, it's when someone's trying to factor it in later. You know, if, it, if it, authenticity is what the company speaks for, stands for, is all about, then it's, then it's easy. <clears throat> I think the, moment, the minute that an organization is getting to that place where they're really trying to think about how they're going to do good or build trust. I mean, that's even a more hilarious conversation is how do we build trust? I think, you know, you, you either have it or you don't. And if you don't have it, it's incredibly difficult to get it. Once you have it, it's incredibly easy to lose it. Mm. The thing is, it's consistently having it from the get-go. And I think uh, for large corporations where, you know, the founders have left or where a lot of the initial DNA of the company has moved on, it's really difficult to to get to factor it back in. That's tough, right? That's tough for a, com a company like Pepsi. Heineken, I think, actually did a pretty good job recently. I don't know if you saw the commercial where they brought people into a room that didn't know one another, and then they revealed their, um, you know, their, their feminist side, or one was transgender. It, that's actually a pretty good commercial from a big organization hmm. that, that appeared to have not manufactured something, but were just genuinely having a, uh, a dialogue and capturing it without Heineken actually having a viewpoint. It, it's pretty smart. I think the point of like you either have trust or you don't is really important. And you made a mention of founders and if the founders have left and 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 and. I think there's a kind of a dirty little secret in many companies that we just don't talk about. And that's that when you think about the system that reinforces the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, where you make a decision to make an advertising campaign that falls flat, like it's happening because really there's one discussion that takes place in the boardroom. Right? You know, as a founder, you sit in the boardroom. You know, as a founder, you sit in the boardroom with your investors and you talk about what the growth looks like quarter to quarter. And that's the key measure for success. That's it. Yeah. Right? There's a very significant kind of lacking of the discussion of trust or the values that you have as an organization that shows up in the boardroom. And even if we want to have a company that does good, that creates product and markets in a way that's authentic or that has authenticity and we trust and like, 
the reality is that the financial systems in most organizations don't reinforce us to have good behavior. So th there's, a, there's a significant amount of inertia that exists in the world, in business in particular, that makes it really difficult to have an organization that creates things that people trust. Yeah. We're just not built that way. No, I think that's a really good point because if we look at what companies are measuring, they're measuring um, you know, time and money, which is time converts to money in a lot of places. And they're not really looking at other kinds of measures that um, countries look at other measures of well-being or social progress. Um, there's tons of different indicators there. Um, some companies internally for their employees are looking at those measures, but we're not looking at those in a business context. And I think if we're not measuring those kind of things that have long-term value, that build a relationship, um, it's really hard to design to those. Especially, I think, if you're in the advertising world. And the advertising industry is, has always been murky. It's probably on a par with real estate. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, if you're in the advertising industry today, it's cat and mouse. So it used to be about chasing CPMs, then it was CTRs, and now it's all about you know, more and more data. And I think in the advertising world, if, if that's your business, it's very hard to build up trust. And there's, I think there's very few companies that are able to do it. And that's why you're seeing in news. That's why we have you know, a conference nearly focused on fake news. Because where do you, you know, who, who's in charge? Who's actually calling the shots on editorial? And I think that's where you'll see some companies like New York Times or The Guardian really standing out, and others you know, suffering where uh, advertising dollars are you know, accounting for everything. Right? Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say we're kind of in a weird place because for advertising and for other business goals, we're trying to almost create a consumer, create an individual made out of data, basically. And hopefully it, it resolves itself into some kind of cohesive whole. But that kind of boxes people in, and it doesn't give them the freedom to explore and um, you know, understand their identity in different ways. And so I think there's a kind of a conflict that's underneath all of this that's at Boy, the, play. the idea of creating a consumer and marketing to them or building stuff for them, I think, is pretty material, right? And yeah. I, we've been fairly segmented globally because of the fact that we can now get to the level of data that allows for us to really break down kind of small groups of people and super be super targeted toward them. But I, I think that there's some pretty significant changes that are happening globally and socially that we all have to pay attention to, especially when we think about kind of being ethical, being kind of good at marketing, being a, a trustworthy organization. These trends are, are pretty fascinating. We probably yeah. feel them a lot, right? And this was interesting. About, about two years ago at Mozilla, we started to think that we were developing a thesis because we would see interactions that were like, well, that's curious, and I think I relate to it. Like, Maybe somebody that you know that's a friend of yours chooses to go shop at Whole Foods, be, not because Whole Foods is less expensive and you get the utility that you need, but because they promise that when you buy from them, you're actually living behind the values that they have. You're supporting right. local farmers. And that's a behavior that's starting to show up more and more. You choose to work with a brand. You use a WeTransfer because you like what you do as a founder. Right? You believe in the values that you have as an organization. That kind of conscious decision to actually make a choice of who you work with, who you buy from, the services that you use, is a lot more than just the utility or the value that is being delivered. It has a relationship to the values. So we thought this was maybe a thesis. We went out and did a bunch of research yeah. around the world and seven different countries. And what we found is that there actually is a group of people that are thinking this way. Like behaviorally, they're, they care more about the purpose of, not just the value of the brands they work from. They're thinking about how they are actually responsible for the exchange of information with who they work with, right? And they're a little bit younger generally, like kind of millennial-minded, not necessarily young from a demographic perspective, but like young thinking. And this group of people is interesting. We call them a conscious chooser. And that we like maybe that's interesting, but it's only interesting if it's a big group of people. And when we went out and sized them, we found that this group of people is actually about 20% of the population of the internet. So yeah. it's about 750 million people in the world. So like, is it good for business, I think, is a, the underlying kind of discussion here to be ethical and to try and develop trust. Well, if this is a group of people that's pretty big, they're probably going to touch your product or your company in some way or another. So you ought to be thinking about how your values have a relationship to the value that you deliver. And it should be just a way that you operate. I think if you go younger, too, I do a lot of research with teens and tweens and kids, um, that shows up even more yeah. significantly. I mean, they, that's a generation that they grew up post 9-11 and recession and 
They're pretty serious kids. They're pretty good kids, and they really want to make a difference. And so they have some really strong ideas about the values that they want to pursue. Because that's the interesting thing, right? Is that you know the internet that we have today is pretty much dictated by four major companies. Yes. And those four companies are pretty much dictating what we do online, how we spend time, and you know how we how we shop, how we do things. And actually, unless we do something, and it's going to be down to that generation or our generation or our kids' generation, nothing will change. And if we want to build up trust and we want to build up authenticity, actually it's in the power of us, the user, the consumer, more so than corporations. So if, you know, I think for my kids going forward, you know, I would like it that if they're spending 27 hours a week on the internet today, that in the future, uh, I mean, unless I can prevent it, they'll probably be spending more time on the internet. Yep. And we should be trying to create that space ourselves but we need to be saying, you know what, I'm done with giving away this data. You know, I'm only going to choose Firefox or I'm going to use DuckDuckGo, whatever it is to make sure that um, you're giving away what you choose to. And if everybody does that, we can actually dictate that space ourselves. And no one else is going to do it for us. I yeah. Think. yeah, and, I think and that's I mean, true. I suppose companies then will have to adapt to this, and, and, and many seem to be trying to. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind when I think of kind of like socially responsible co companies that have like a seemingly authentic message but aren't necessarily like a B Corp or a nonprofit is, is like a Starbucks. Starbucks has kind of been out there, particularly its CEO, former, now former CEO, Howard Schultz. Executive chairman now. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of being out there and saying, you know, we're going to be hiring uh, veterans, we're going to hire immigrants, uh, we want uh, our baristas to uh, get an education. Um, but at the same time, they're still a for profit company. They're, they're still a company with investor cone. Uh, how do you see companies trying to figure out a middle way between still being a public company, still, you know, needing to return money to investors, still needing to be being able to make a profit, but also trying to embrace this authenticity so that they don't have their Pepsi money. There's yeah. nothing wrong with making money, right? I think that's, that's a fundamental thing. I think there's actually healthy to make sure that you can sustain what it is that you set up to do. I think actually the, 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 the concept of having a charitable organization or a foundation that has no income stream that's totally reliant on donation is not sustainable in itself. So I don't know if that's you know, the direction you should go in. So I think you know, profit or um, you know, healthy revenue streams is, is totally normal. And I think you need that to make something big, to make a difference. And I, th I think the, the thing that we've at least experienced in our company is, is generosity is the thing that, that we would, would like to be associated with and we would like to work with people that are generous. You know, in the creative world, it's artists, musicians, whatever, who give a lot of their time to help promote something or do something good. Um, and I think organizations, if they have a focus on generosity and that doesn't always have to be a money, but it can be in kind or time or something, I think you'll find that the organization, employees, the partners, the relationships you have with salespeople will automatically feel so much more authentic. There will be so much more trust. If you ask your employees, you know, what organizations would you like to support or could we get involved in, you'll find everybody has something they would like to do. And then you know, trying to work out whether you're going to do something with time or with marketing or with money or whatever to, to, to make that difference. And then talk about those things. You'll you'll build trust from the in, inside out, and it will be visible to everybody. I think yeah. it's it, there's a, a big yes and an and, and like we we struggle with the fiduciary responsibilities in many businesses. Like the the idea that enough revenue is enough revenue right. is actually something that most organizations never talk about. It's it's how do I consolidate more? How do I get bigger? How do I grow you, you faster? You get sued for talking like that. It's okay. <laughs> right, absolutely. But, but there's, a, there's a, a serious kind of lack of discussion around why doing good is also good business. Right. Right? Like the, the research is loose at best to make the business case, which we have to, understanding the inertia of the way that the business world operates today, there's a loose business case that if you do good, you also do well as a business. Starbucks is a great example, but I guess, uh, another example is if you look at the Fortune 100 and SurveyMonkey kind of most trusted company list, it's like 100 companies that are yeah. selected each year through a, kind of a pretty sizable panel that's done. If you look at those 100 companies, like, the proof needs to be that those 100 companies that are the most trusted also perform best. And it, like, if you want to make this case, you've got to go so far as to take a look at those companies, understand kind of their financial performance, and then compare them to general businesses. We looked at that data uh, uh, about a half a year ago. Fortune 100 list, we looked at the S&P 500, and we took an average of the public stock price performance over the last five years. And public stock performance 
is not necessarily an indicator of how successful the business is, but we'll use it as a proxy right now because right. the point of maybe this isn't, it's a little bit of a flimsy argument, but we, we kind of had an expectation that those 100 most trusted companies were going to perform better over five years in the S&P 500. And what we found is surprising, that answer was yes, they perform from a public stock perspective better than the S&P 500, but interestingly, the top 10 companies in the most trusted 100 list and the bottom trusted companies in the most trusted companies list performed differently. 26% better performance in public stock price from the top 10 companies to the bottom 10 companies. And these are the 100 most trusted companies. So there, there's a lot more work I think everybody that's sitting here and we can all do to help prove that case of doing good is also good for business. I would and love to do that same list with internet companies. Yeah, yeah. right? Absolutely. So I mean, Absolutely. trust on the internet is a fascinating topic, right? Because there's, if, if I, I mean, if I ask the audience today what would be their favorite website, almost guarantee that no one has one. Mashable. Yeah. Mashable, of yeah. course. <laughs> But it's, it's, if it is going to be one, it's likely to be news. So people will default to, I love The Guardian, Mashable, whatever it is. But it's rarely a website of some, of some other sort. Um, and then you get into, you know, do you trust those websites where you spend you know, a disproportionate amount of your time? And generally, the answer is no. And that's, that's quite a frightening thing, right? I mean, so that, and, and most of our business is going online. So if we're building this community, which is online, which is supposed to be all grounded in trust, and yet none of the companies that are online are actually trusted, we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. well, we do have a lot of work to do, <laughs> yeah. no doubt. I mean, and that's a huge gap between what people perceive as trust. You know, like, you can state your values that's as a company, true. but do people then perceive that you represent those values yeah. is another thing, right? We have lots of internet companies saying they represent this value or that value, but does it get expressed in the the work and your experience of it in your day-to-day -day life using it? That's trickier. Well, that's actually maybe a good thing to just finish up on, which is, yeah, what, what is modern authenticity and trust? And is it the same thing that you know maybe was true in the pre-internet era? Because certainly now we live in a time where we will use products, but we will say we won't trust them. But it would seem that consumer actions tend to be different than you know what they tell us in, in surveys. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it, it, we pay for convenience, right? So people will say they don't particularly like Facebook, but then spend you know, 45 minutes a day on it. People will say that you know, they may not like the values of an X company, but if that X company is delivering you something within six minutes, for sure you're going to use it. And if the, if the nearest competitor takes 12 minutes to deliver that thing, they're dead to us. You know, we, this is why it goes back to, in my point of view, we just, it's down to us to change something. It is. We and need to make it easier for people to, yeah. to trust us and to have that kind of autonomy and control over their experience. Yeah. And I, I argue that on, on, as the end to both of those comments, it's not even necessarily us that we have to worry about. Like, as an organization, we're building products for the future. Yes, we have to sustain ourselves right now, but there's a gigantic population that's growing, and it's growing faster than any other population. Absolutely. And they don't just care about the utility of the stuff that we deliver. So that question of, maybe I don't like Facebook, maybe I do, but I'm still gonna spend 45 minutes on there because I get the utility for it. Like, the younger generation's not doing the same thing anymore. No. And we have to adapt, especially in the Gen X and kind of millennials yeah. that are now running many of the companies that are out there. Like, it's not us that we're building for anymore. Yeah. And, and that's going to impact the way that companies are trusted or not, because we're either going to work for this new group of people that are the major influencers or buyers, or we're not. And I think it's going to be fairly binary. Yeah. But it's kind of almost like you know we could use a new version of Consumer Reports that's a little bit more focused in the digital age and kind of yeah. like about topics that aren't just you know will this car you know break down, rather does this company have a history of selling my data? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I think you know Tristan Harris has got this website and program time well spent, I think as a metric, you know, for rather than talking about CPAs or CPMs, all that other rubbish, you know, talking about whether people are spending their time well on things, I think is a is fundamentally great metric for whatever service is being built online. I think that could be the thing that we were starting to measure and really looking at people, wh whether they're getting what we intended them to get out of that service or that platform, whatever. That would be a fantastic thing to sell advertising against or to I would, build a I would platform just, around. I would just add to that that I think because technology has been created around productivity and efficiency, those have been the values that we look at the drawbacks as time. I actually would say that meaning is probably a more important metric than time that we're spending. And that's how kids 
teens, youth are looking at it. They're not looking at it as like, oh, I spent too much time on my phone or too much time online. Instead, it's, did I, did I get meaning out of it? Did I make a connection that was, had a purpose in my life or that deepened a relationship? So. Yeah, meaning is an interesting way to think about it in the sense of, was, was this like a useful experience for me? Which I guess kind of ties back to what we were talking about at the very beginning. It's kind of an opportunity for companies. If, it, if people are looking to, to find meaningful experiences in a world where you can you know, reach them in a variety of different ways, you can still screw it up, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you can screw it up in a big way. We're, we're approaching the end of just selling and buying off of value and utility. Like it's not the, it's not the common sentiment of the vast majority of people in the world right now, but it is the last few decades of the way that we built and sold and consumed stuff mm -hmm. for the value and its utility. Value and values together is the future. And you can only get there if you're taking a long-term view. I think something that is it's, it's fundamental to trust or authenticity or anything else is if you're looking for a short-term win, fast cash, you know, to ramp up your user base from nothing to five million in, in a month, you, you can't possibly build it, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. If you take a long-term view, a long-term perspective on actually building a product or a service that people really want to spend time with and enjoy, and you have a 10-year horizon or something else, then you can build up all those things, and they'll come um, just naturally to that service. Uh, and I'm not sure that Silicon Valley has helped in this issue or this topic, because it's, you know, we're talking about three-year, five-year horizons. I don't know any company in the real world, in the physical world, that's built up a trusted, authentic brand within three or five years. It's nearly impossible, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that's all the time we have. I want to thank you guys for taking the time. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Everyone.